Welcome to the Level Up Leader Podcast. My name is Michael King. I'm an executive coach that helps leaders find clarity, expand their vision, make sure they have all the right system strategies and structures in place to be able to amplify the right culture and create what they need to do their business at a level that they've never seen before. On today's podcast, I am joined by David Page. David Page comes from a long historical background of some incredibly creative and exciting endeavors, starting off as an investigative journalist going all the way to actually creating diners, drive-ins, and dives, and now he is diving into some new endeavors. I'm excited for you to be able to check out what David has to offer today on this podcast as he talks about leading by example. So everybody, welcome David Page to the Level Up Leader Podcast. Mr. David Page, welcome to the Level Up Leader podcast. It's so great to have you today. Thank you very much for having me. Now, in our pre-show interview, we kind of chatted a little bit about uh, about your story and just a little bit of your history, and you definitely have, have quite an entertaining journey. So why don't you give give me and just the listeners a little bit of an overview of like, man, what has your journey been about and what does that look like for you? I was driving, well, I was in the back seat. I was a kid into uh, New York City from Long Island with my parents one day listening. They were listening to WNEW radio, which was the middle of the road powerhouse uh, of New York City and by extension, the country. And William B. Williams was joking around. And I said to my father, I want to do that. And he poo pooed it. He said, what? Now be a disc jockey? Well, nah, that's no, no way of life. Um, and uh, somehow that stuck with me when it was time to go to high school. I knew that the local prep school had a carrier current radio station. So I convinced my parents to send me there as a day student. Uh, from that, I followed radio and then TV jobs around the country. Uh, worked uh, especially as an investigative reporter in a number of markets. Got picked up by NBC News, got sent overseas, uh, which I had never expected and was unprepared for. So I found myself learning a whole lot about countries while I was there. I remember early in my my tenure, I was in Cairo for some some event that was so large that a vice president from New York had come over to run it. And he walks up to me and he says, Paige, go to Khartoum. I said, OK, turned to one of the locals and said, where's Khartoum? They said, it's in the Sudan. I said, where's the Sudan? They said, one country south. <laughs> so I I, um, I picked up uh, and went to Khartoum. Uh, I, uh, I worked overseas for a number of years uh, covering some of the biggest events uh, in 20th century history. I walked through the Berlin Wall the night it opened. Uh, came back to the States, became a show producer at NBC, then moved over to ABC, uh, ran the investigative unit at 2020, then became one of the three rotating senior producers who a week at a time put Good Morning America on the air, um, left after I was advised that uh, there was going to be a million dollar winner in Who Wants to Be a Millionaire that night and that the next morning I would have the winner in my first half hour. And I realized that network news was not quite what it had been. Got out of there and went to uh, Minneapolis to work for <laughs> a uh, TV shopping channel. Didn't like that. Opened a production company. Uh, at my production company, I created the show Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives for the Food Network. Uh, then moved on from that, wrote a book uh, about uh, American food called Food Americana. Uh, these days, um, I'm back with my first love of radio, which I started when I was 14. Uh, my first job, I'm syndicating a show called Martini Music, which is uh, the music of the 30s, 40s, and into the mid 50s. And that, in a nutshell, is uh, is the whole story. Fantastic. Well, thank you, David Page, for being with us today. I think we covered all the pieces. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Um, well, I was I was intrigued about t- to have you on the show. I love working with creatives, um, and I'm a 
I'm a musician and recording artist is, is kind of a thing as well as uh, being an executive coach. Um, but I'm also a huge foodie. Um, and so when I heard that you were one of the brains behind making Triple D happen, I was like, I want to talk to this guy. I want to Let me be up. rude. I was the only brain behind making Triple D happen. I, that's, it came out of my head. So how did that happen? Well, uh, I opened my production company and I was starving because uh, I was failing at selling anything to anybody. I called up Al Roker, who had and still has a production company uh, in addition to his NBC gig. Before Al was on the main Today Show, he was on the weekend show, which I co-created. So we were buddies. I called him up. I said, hey, you got any work? I'm starving. He said, yeah, I'm doing a lot of stuff for the Food Network. I'll subcontract some of it to you. So I started doing things for the Food Network through Al's production company, which uh, made me a known entity to the network. Um, Al and I understood, both of us understood that I wasn't going to get rich uh, working through him. Uh, so I went ahead and began pitching the network on my own. And I was getting nowhere. Uh, you know, I had, I had a leg up in that there was an executive who would talk to me which if you're trying to pitch a network is kind of important. But she kept saying no. Finally, I had done a documentary for them through Al about diners. And one day I'm on the phone pitching her. And in frustration, she says, don't you have anything else about diners? And I said, oh, absolutely. I'm developing this program called Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. And I told her all about it. And to my surprise, she said, you know, that sounds interesting. Uh, get me a write-up on Monday. We have a development meeting on Tuesday. Hung up the phone. I, I was delighted that she was interested, but I, I had kind of a problem in that I had I was not developing a show called Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. I had just made the name up during the phone call, and now, now I had a and I explained the show to her in great detail, uh, but it was all um, smoke that that I was blowing. Uh, and this was late on, I think, a Thursday afternoon, maybe a Friday. So I had the weekend to call around the country and try to come up with restaurants and people. And anyway, I, I wrote up uh, what's called a one sheet, a proposal, got it to her on Monday. Shortly thereafter, they picked up a special, a one hour special to star Guy Fieri, who had recently won their Food Network Star Contest. They, at the time, thought that that contest was going to generate their next generation of stars. In fact, he's pretty much the only one uh, who ever went on to anything after the contest. But uh, they were looking for something to keep him in front of the public while they developed a, a primetime show for him with a big deal production company. They, they'd asked two of them for proposals. I did the special. It rated well. They looked at the proposals from the big deal production companies and didn't like them and cautiously greenlit a, uh, a short first season of diners. And it went from there. And now the rest is st it's still actually happening. It's still a very popular show. Yeah. I left after the 11th season. It's now in season 40 something. Wow. Seasons are 13 episodes. I mean, it hasn't been on for 40 years. <laughs> so then you wrote a book, uh, food mm -hmm. Americana. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I did. So, that uh, very well. I, uh, it's my search to find and define American cuisine, which is, in fact, more than hot dogs and hamburgers. Uh, I, I learned when I was working internationally that, that food is a gateway into the soul of a culture. And our cuisine, just as America at its best, to use a cliche, is described as an immigration melting pot, uh, he said, wearing his left-wing political views on his sleeve, uh, American food is also a melting pot. Immigrants brought various cuisines with them. We then modified them, uh, revised them, made them our own. And together, they created an American cuisine. American pizza is not the pizza you find in Naples, but it became what it was because of an abundance. Pardon me, I'm going to clear my throat. An abundance of items like meat available to the poor here that were not available to the poor in Naples. We have Chinese American, which is quite different than the food you'll find in China, but which evolved from the immigration to the states of Cantonese gold miners uh, to California uh, for the gold rush. And and they uh, some of them opened restaurants and modified the food to fit American tastes, which did not skew toward the awful and interior body parts that much of Cantonese cuisine and other cultures uh, favor uh, in their foods. Um, 
so we've we've created uh, sushi, in my view, as eaten here is is now part of American cuisine. So that that's the book. Pick it up at Amazon. Food Americana. We'll definitely include that include that link in our show notes. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about your radio show that's that's coming up here in a few minutes. Um, maybe we'll do that a little bit more on the on the back end of this, um, sure. just because I think that's super interesting to me as well. You've had a you've had a a long career uh, in which your resume, when you start to list off the the singular opportunities that you've had to be in front of high level influence people um, and to be able to create uh, interesting products and programs, et cetera, um, you've definitely had quite quite the share of opportunities for you to be able to make a really big impact. Um, you mentioned to me just in the in the pre show interview, you were like, "Yeah, my attention spans a little a little short. I, I kind of like to move on to things. Pretty, uh, you like to do a lot of things." Um, what is, what is your, what is the next thing for you? Well, I'm getting old. I mean, eventually it's going to be death. Uh, <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I'm deeply involved in the radio show right now because we're still in the phase. Well, I'll, I'll remain involved in it. I do the whole thing myself. Uh, after the radio show is, um, smoothly running, I do have a second book in me that I, I may go back to. Um, or I may do, uh, try to sell a TV documentary or, or something. I, it's, I, I have a number of concepts for other books or projects that interest me that are sitting in the possibles file. I'm, I'm fascinated by the way in which American business has monetized poor service, how over the years, human interaction with customers has been diminished, how um, the concept of escalation by which um, you you intentionally allow customers to get really pissed off before you send the few of them who really will stay with it up to another level to deal with humans. That's a book I may write. Uh, that, that one's in the possibles file. That's uh that's that's intriguing as well. So you're you're out in the Jersey Shore now. Um, yep. living your living your best life. Uh, you said you, you have a, a nice porch that oversees some water in which you can wave at your neighbors from a distance. So that is correct. So I love that. Um, when you look at your life as far as like what life looks like for you five years from now, what's the what does that picture look like for you? Five years from now, um, waving at my neighbors and continuing to do something creative. I don't. I just turned 68. I don't see retirement is not a thing. I, I, I am not somebody who went to an office job and then one day stopped going to that office job so he could fly fish. My, my hobbies are my avocations. In other words, if I find something interesting and creative, I do it. It's, it's not as if at some point I'm going to stop doing that. Um, there, there's there's no formal concept of, well, that was my years of working. Now, now it's over. You got to do something. And I don't fly fish. <laughs> um, that's really that's great. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of wired the same way. It's like I, I'm in I'm so much in love with the things that I get to do. And I'm also a creative to where I don't really have necessarily see an end date to the things that I'm a part of. I see different chapters, but um, but not necessarily just you know, hanging it up and just, you know, chilling out. You know, I, I could, uh, I look forward to dying in a skydiving accident at the age of 109. We'll go ahead and uh, make reference to that and maybe even pop a date on the calendar just to remind you that. Just you in case. Hey, look, my mother-in-law is 104 and, and just got a new boyfriend. So uh, everything's possible. Everything is possible. All right, real quick here. So, um, just kind of to, to go down this list with the, that we ask all of the guests when they're when they're on the Level Up Leader podcast. But the first one is is at some point in time in your life you decided, you know what? I think I need to level up my own personal leadership in order for me to actually go to the next level. Do you have a moment that you can recall that looked like that? Yeah, I came back to the states. I was the on font Tareeb super duper producer overseas uh, for NBC in in europe i mean i also covered africa in the middle east i was a hot shot um i was iconoclastic i was braggadocious i was um I, I was me i was all about me 
I was brought back to the States to become a senior producer of a relatively unimportant show, but nonetheless. And I was brought back, you know, NBC was owned by GE, um, and which had the reputation of, of great management training. NBC offered none. I was brought back without even being told exactly what a senior producer on a show does and certainly was not sent to any kind of a course to be given any kind of management training whatsoever. And I started breaking a lot of pottery. I um, was not. And it's been a problem for me uh, as a leader throughout my career. Uh, if you're talented, I'm good with you. If you're not talented, I um I kind of give up on you and I might not be the nicest person on earth. Um, and I found in my first senior producer role that I was tripping over myself an awful lot and, and pissing people off and not necessarily getting the best out of people with with honey. Um, and I had to uh, I had to work on that. And um, in all candor, uh, it's always been an Achilles heel for me. I, I've yeah. uh, I've never in um, an instinctively great manager. Uh, I can motivate. I can lead by example. I can get involved if you're good. I'm, I'm delighted to help make you better. But I don't have the patience I should have for those who are less than wonderful. That's fair. That's fair. I, I think that, um, well, not that I think, but I know with the scope of work that we do in coaching, uh, you know, entrepreneurs all the way through uh, Fortune 500 executives. One of the biggest issues that people have, especially when they're inherited a team, is uh, having reasonable expectations of knowing what can you actually expect out of the tribe that you inherited. Um, and also, too, if, like if you're building a team, um, you're not the only one out there, by the way, that's just like I work with leaders all the, all the time that kind of break people into two different camps. You're either a leader or you're a talent. You can't be both, apparently, in this world. Um, Sarcastic. Well, this, this, look, you're absolutely right. This got a lot easier for me when I had my own production company because I did the yeah. hiring. Um, and because I did the hiring, I was invested in. If I assume you have talent, I don't want to be wrong. Um, I, one particular individual, uh, I hired as a writer, and then I made her chief writer. She was good at that. And then I made her the number two in the company, and she was awful at it. And I invited her to a breakfast meeting one morning, and we sat down, and I said, obviously, this isn't working. What do you want to do? She said, I want to go back to my old job, but I thought you were calling me here to fire me. And I said, why would I fire you? You were really good at your old job. Um, but again, I had hired her. I was uh, I was invested in this. Now, I didn't. One of the freedoms I had as the boss, the owner, is I didn't have to waste a whole lot of time on, for example, managing someone out. Uh, specifically, uh, we used a fair number at one point of freelance editors. And if a freelancer was hired and came back for a review of a first cut and I gave them notes, if at the second cut they, they didn't get it, I would pay off their freelance contract and say goodbye, which was seen by some as cruel, heartless, whatever. But at that point, I knew it wasn't going to work. It was going to be too much work for me. So thank you. Here's your money. Um, we'll finish the project. Um, which to me made a lot of sense to some people was seen as me being a major asshole. Really just kind of depends on the way that you communicate and, and uh, value somebody during that process <clears throat> for you being a leader. I ask people this question all the time when they're dealing with personnel issues. Um, three years from now, what do you see your relationship like this particular person looking like? And if they tell me that three years from now, if they're feeling like in that moment, I don't really see this, like, you know, I don't see this playing out. Why, why waste time? Yeah, absolutely. But see, I also, because I'm emotionally invested in my creative projects, I did not use the model that has worked very well for some other people, notably Jeff Zucker, when he was running the Today Show. Um, all bad news came from his number two. Jeff only dealt with people in the happy way. 
And I suspect, I mean, I don't know what his tenure at CNN was like, but they loved him there. So I, I mean, pardon me, I suspect he continued that. So what you're saying is that you went a completely different route and you chose to lead through uh, honesty and transparency and just yes. get all the Yes. The and, and I was, I wouldn't lie to people about expectations and results, but I was deeply invested in um, training and education firsthand. This is why I think we should do. Well, I didn't say I think this is why we should do this this way. And here's why, um, you know, if someone brought a an episode into my office to screen, uh, I would play it on my computer. And when I got to something I didn't like, I would turn around, face the computer, make the change myself and show them why it made a difference, expecting that next time they would understand that production technique and employ it. Um, you, you have to start with show and tell. That's you know, especially in a creative business, I've always prided myself on the fact that I've never been one of those senior or executive producers who says to someone upon screening, it doesn't work for me. And then you send someone back to figure out why no it's here's what doesn't work for me and here's what i'm suggesting parentheses directing you to do to fix it that's really good um your level up leader tip that you that you submitted was that uh leading by example and then kind of leading into this idea of making sure that you allow those that you teach to be able to shadow absolutely yeah i value that very <clears throat> I don't Look, know, have you it's, heard of what is that when it comes to mentorship and um and development, the process of I do, you watch, I do, you assist, uh, we do, and then it kind of transpires from there, eventually getting the person that's shadowing you to be able to actually work it out. Yeah, you can't expect someone to know something they don't know. You have to show them and give them an opportunity to try it. And then they'll either know it or they won't. Now, those in a creative world who can't, they don't stay with you very long. You can't have that. You need, look, I never hired based on um, television experience so much as I hired based on two things. These are the only two things you need in any kind of journalistic or beyond that creative endeavor. You need intelligence and you need curiosity. If you're not curious, I have no interest in you. That's powerful. That's good. That's that, that'll be that'll be a standout quote from this. If if you're if you're not curious, curiosity. There's something incredibly powerful about curiosity. Um, man, so good. Um, all right. So we'll fast forward here. So now you've you've gotten all this stuff going on, and now you're like, you know what? I'm going to create a, ra- a syndicated radio show, diving into the history of big band era jazz and all that cool stuff. Talk to me about that. Where are you at with it? Look, I started in radio when I was, as I said, you know, as a child, it interested me. And then I got my first professional job when I was, I believe 15. Um, So my first love has always been radio to this day. There's a website, musicradio77.com dedicated to WABC when it was a, top 40 station, the greatest top 40 station that ever existed back in the 60s and 70s. To this day, off that website, I entertain myself by listening to air checks of Dan Ingram, the greatest DJ who ever lived. And I burst out laughing at at his double entendres 65 years after he said them and, and 10 years after he died. So radio's always been a thing for me. You know, some people sing along with the radio in the car. I did the breaks between songs. So I, uh, I had started working on my second book and I had been doing for about, I don't know, a year in my spare time. There's a, um, a low power community station about an hour South of here. And I was doing a show for them called uh, Simply Classic, which was the best of any genre. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, I'm enjoying this. I, maybe I should do more of this. So um, I went online. I found a syndication company. I sent them some examples of the work and said, you know, is this saleable? Did, would this be interesting? They came back to me and they said, absolutely. But you got to pick uh, a genre. 
And I said, well, I, I want to do uh, swing, crooners, big bands. And they came up with the name Martini Music, and they're out peddling the show. And we're in a handful of markets now and growing because uh, syndication is something you, you pedal a show at a time, a station at a time. But I'm doing two hours a week, and I'm loving it. That's that's really really awesome. Um, I gotta I gotta figure out how to uh, to be able to get access to it. So that'd be that'd be really cool. So, um, your so your ask is that one of the things is that uh, we can all kind of get behind you as part of being a part of the uh, level of leader tribe is to call your local radio station and to ask for the Martini Music radio show. Tell, tell them that they should be carrying Martini Music, which is brokered by syndication networks, um, and. Help, help me help me grow the roster of stations. Fantastic. And so if somebody wants to get a hold of you directly, how can they do that? I'm on Facebook or um, in all candor, I uh, there's no secret. I'll give out my email. Uh, page prod as in productions, but someone's squatting that page prod at iCloud dot com page prod at iCloud dot com. That is fantastic. So, um, so, so we have a Facebook group that goes along with the Level Up Leader podcast. So there's a couple hundred people that are in that that are just they actively engage with, uh, with the people that are on the show. So and I've uh, I've joined. I'm there. Yep, I see that. So thank you for doing that. And so as soon as uh, it's, I just encourage everybody to uh, to just throw some questions your way. And when you're when Please. it's live. Just pop the link in there as far as where people can, you know, if they, if there's anything that we need to know to be able to get behind you to promote your radio show, but uh, man, this has been fascinating and enlightening and fun. Um, you know, you, you, when talking to you, you definitely, you, I know when I'm talking to somebody that has a seasoned radio voice and uh, <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things, uh, weird, random, just fun fact about me. So I, you know, I love to, I love Food Network stuff. I love jazz music. Um, I'm a saxophonist and guitarist, piano player, all that stuff. Um, so I love all those things. But one of the things that I also I fall asleep every night listening to, to uh, or watching Forensic Files. And, <laughs> um, but it has nothing to do with the content. It's not like this crime thriller murder thing. That's that's me. It literally is because the the guy that narrates the show he's he's got that radio voice that's going to put you to sleep, right? And um, and so you got a talent, man. Go Thank you it. very much. Thank you. Much appreciated. I love it, man. Thank you so much. All right, David Page, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, I'm excited to see what happens to you next. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on the Level Up Leader podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps to get the word out. And make sure to like, subscribe, and follow so you get all of the episodes. Also, a special thank you to our featured artist, Names Without Numbers, for allowing us to use their music. We decided we only wanted to feature music that I've produced in the studio, so we think that's pretty cool. To find out more about everything that we're up to, please check us out at teams.coach, and don't forget to join our Facebook group at teams.coach slash leveluploaders.